what people don't realize is that when you see someone that looks like you who is on the ground and someone has their knee for nine minutes and with no, no, no hesitation of just letting this man die, what you see is that they're doing it to you because you're a man and you're black. Hello and welcome to The Middle. I'm Gaina Lynn Condi, your host, and I am so excited to welcome my guest and my friend, Alex Boyer. Thank you for having me. Thank this you is for so cool. being here. We didn't even plan to match in our I know. blazers today, yeah, but we, we, did. we did. I love this setup we have. I, I, I love it too. I, I may not go home, so yeah. if I'm always at the set, my husband may need to send a search party. <laughs> right. Where are you? Come she back. There's a from futon the... right there at the corner <laughs> yes. of the studio. <laughs> yes. I'm so grateful that you're here because we are in the middle of something as a global and national community, and you are a perfect teacher and ambassador. Are you okay with that title? I'll take it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you, if you're joining us and you've never heard of Alex Boyer, then I don't know what planet you've been living on because <laughs> everyone That's knows so who funny. you are. <laughs> Quick bio, though, you are not generally known as the ambassador or the teacher. You are generally known as the amazing musician, vocalist. Is that probably what yeah, you're known? Yeah, yeah, singer. And where where you originated from allows you to sound smarter and cooler. Oh, than right. All of us. <laughs> yes, so right. Yeah. Come on. I have my moments. <laughs> you grew up where? Yeah, I grew up in London, England. Yes. And yeah, for pretty much most of my life, I lived there till I was 30. And then I moved to Utah, the age of 30. And you are married with a beautiful family that's yeah. ever growing. Yeah, we have se seven kids and one on the way. At the time S of this taping. Same mother. <laughs> Anyway, right. <laughs> which goes into our conversation. Yes, knows. yes. When I'm outside of Utah, if you say same mother in Utah, and I was like, oh, yeah, whatever, good for you. When you say outside Utah, they're like, what? Yes. I remember one time I was hanging out with all these brothers, all my brothers, the homeboys at the recording studio, right? And they're like, how many kids you got? Because at first, are you married? I said, yeah, man, how many kids you got? I'm like, I have seven kids. Really? How many baby mothers? I'm like, just one. What? <laughs> And they're like calling him, Leroy, come over here, man. This guy got one mother, got seven kids, man. How you do that? And it's just like, it's like it was accomplished. It I'm is like, a huge accomplishment. I don't know. Utah's it's a not a big deal. But anyway, yeah, yeah, it's a huge accomplishment. Your, um, <laughs> your gen genealogy, though, does not trace only to London. Yeah. It traces to... Nigeria, Nigeria, West Africa. My mom and dad is from Nigeria, from West Africa. We yes. speak a language called Yoruba. Yes. Which is a uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, Nigerian or Western African dialect. You came here in your 30s. Mm -hmm. And today we're going to have a conversation. Everything here at The Middle is about being in the middle of something. And I think what's unique about this show and what we really want to emphasize is that so often when you find yourself in the middle of something, you wonder, is it ever going to end? Yeah. And there is always a backstory to how you got to the middle of where you're at. Yeah. But all the faith affirming and inspirational stories that we read, we usually get to see the beginning, the middle and the end. Yeah. And when you're living the middle, you're like, I can't do this forever. And today you've generously offered time to talk about a really big middle, which yeah. is the subject of race. Yeah, I would say that the subject of race, that this has been the longest middle that America's ever had. How many years? And probably will ever have. 400 yeah. years. 400 years and we've so, been living this middle. Yeah. And, and and we've got to look at it this way. It's like I was I was talking to a friend of mine um, and he said, the thing is, is in America right now, when you think of everything, all the tragedies that happened during those 400 years towards the beginning, the slave trade and everything, and you look at the way they were treated, where you're talking about, he's saying his grandmother was still in a segregated school. His grandmother was still drinking out of white fountains, not like great, great, grand, you know, great, I mean, black fountains, right? Not great, great. He was like his grandmother. So it's like so recent. And it's like, I feel that it just keeps coming back. It's like Groundhog Day. You know that movie yes. where it's like, I love that. it's like it doesn't get fixed. Yeah. Until, you know you what I mean? You keep learning until the lesson. Until you get learning the lesson. And I feel like that this is what this is with race. It's Groundhog Day. Because a lot of times there are many people that didn't go for the experience. They weren't slave owners today. They weren't, you know, all this. So they're like, what's that got to do with me? But what, I've, what, what I'm learning and I'm realizing is that every time you go back online, it's still there. You could say, I have nothing to do with that. That wasn't me. That wasn't my family. I didn't get participate in this. 
and and the things I'm the most I'm the least prejudiced person you'll ever know or ever see right. you know that kind of stuff and but then what happens you go online and it faces you right there right so it's like you're gonna keep getting it and it's not going to go away until it's fixed well and do you well, feel hopeful that each generation finds a new layer to the story and moves the needle so to speak towards a, a better way or yeah. do you think that um, because we all have biases, mm -hmm. like every single one of us has yeah. a bias. So when yeah. you say that people go online and they're like, I don't, I'm not white yeah. privileged. I'm, I'm not racist. Yeah. I'm not, I don't understand what all this black yeah. lives matter stuff yeah. is about. And, and then you say to them, but every one of us has a bias, not just news outlets, yeah. Yeah. right? Every one of us has had a life experience. Yeah. We walk into a room yeah. and within four seconds, I think there's been specific decision. research yeah. about this, that we can look at each other and go, oh, we're not going to be friends or, oh, oh, that person is this. Get this. This is crazy. So it was, it's in LA. There's a museum out there. Okay. And in the museum, I was looking at this online. They have two doors, right? And you, and, and you stand in front of the doors and one says prejudiced. And I'm prejudiced. And they ask you to choose which door applies to you. So, of course, everyone Everybody. walks into the brazen. And so, like, the, the white dude will go in and he'll say, oh, I'm totally unprejudiced. So, and it's locked. And then the black dude will go in and, I got this, I got this. <laughs> it's locked. What? And it's never open. It's permanently locked. So you go through the 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 prejudice, prejudice one and that's how you go into the museum and it takes you through it takes you through everything oh, through the museum that's brilliant. isn't that a powerful yeah. entrance what and a door I, think, I was like whoa shut up i yes. think that's how we that's where we should all start when someone says to me i'm the least prejudiced person on the planet you know you all that kind of stuff you can't even have a conversation it's like well the, the when when the conversation will happen is when you get rid of that narrative in your life because it's not true so when you came to America versus juxtapose your experience growing up, because I think when we're talking about the middle, it helps to know the, the beginnings. Yeah. For you, you just shared a really quick synopsis of 400 years of the beginning of our middle or mm -hmm. our middle that we're experiencing mm -hmm. as a community. What was your beginnings like? What, what was an example of your first taste of that prejudice store being opened? So many times uh, I was... Um... I was homeless at the age of 16 and I had some in, in experiences. I, when I joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, my family kicked me out of the house. And so that was like tough. But even before that and after, I, I kind of bounced around foster parents and foster parents. It's so interesting. I had at one time I had white foster parents and then I had black foster parents. So I went to the White Foster Prince and I learned, you know, Genesis and 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 Phil Collins and you know what I mean, and uh, all these groups and YouTube. White people. And then that's all they played. And then I went to a black, old black family, old Jamaican, and I'm listening to, you know, what I mean, um, you know, Bob, Bob Marley, Marley and oh, Motown and all this stuff, you know. <laughs> so it was like then all of a sudden I'm I'm just got this between those two families. I just like had this just like concoction of all, all different types of music and culture I and just that. everything. Was that and a so blessing for you to it see? It was, but at the, the time I didn't see it as yeah. a blessing. Maybe we need you know? to have you back on to talk about being in the middle of being in foster care. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Okay. You I heard it. He but said yeah, yes. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, uh, so as I as I started growing up, I started, uh, even in England, I was having, uh, going through a lot of racial uh, experiences and situations Um uh some people would say it's not as obvious, but sometimes that's even more scary. Right. Like the, under the yeah, like the systemic race. Because everyone's like, what is systemic racism? It's the stuff that is not obvious, but that is still screams racism. Give an that example. That because you don't speak it. Let's say, for example, um, let's say you get like I was, I was at a boarding school and the boarding school that I went to. Everyone asked me, how the heck did you get here? <gasps> I was the only one, I was like, you know, there was more whites than blacks. So it's like, how did you, how the heck did you get here? You know what I mean? I think a great just movie that, like that. Yeah. shows systemic racism is Just Mercy, if you haven't yeah, watched yeah. That. that. I think it it shows, like you said, where the structures yeah. or the decision makings or the organizations create that versus yeah. this overt racism, which is what a lot of people think, well, I don't deal with that. I yeah. don't deal with that. Yeah, but 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 everyone is a part of it whether they know it or aware of it or not, you know? And um, it's, it's, it's a powerful thing. I remember I had an experience. I was at a nightclub. I was performing with my my band, and I just finished and everything. And this this white guy came up to me, and he's like, mad. He's like, why are you wearing glasses in a nightclub? And he stood over me like this, and I was, we went at it. 
got into a huge fight. The security came, okay? And they took me. They put me in, held me in a room. They let the dude go. And then the next minute, the police came. They took me to prison. I slept there overnight. While Meanwhile, this guy is, you know, just Walking chilling free. at home, just like, you know, going to the... You know, the and rest. those kinds of stories. It was just things like that. And then, so when I when I was there, I I slept there overnight, and I was crying my eyes. I was like, "It's the first." Time. I was like, "What is going on?" Then, in the next day, they were like saying to me, "You know, so uh, wh where are you from, and what are you doing, and all that kind of stuff." And I was like, "I was a performer." I was a, this guy, and I told them what happened, and they still they was like, "Well, he's pressing charges." I'm like, "He's pressing charges?" Yeah, his family's his family's pressing charges. You know, and then I I did something that really saved me. I lifted up my shirt and I turned around and I said, you see the scar at the back of my neck? I said, I had scoliosis. I had a five hour operation. This was only three years ago. I had a, a body brace. Okay. I've got to protect myself. Do you think the last thing I'm going to do is get into a fight? And they looked wow. at this scar and literally my scar saved me. Oh, that's literally. That's some good symbolism. I mean, so right there, there. yeah. So there was, there, there's been a lot of those experiences where I'm automatically seen as the guilty one, right? Before I even open my mouth. And if you haven't had that experience, and then if you have had that experience, those stories stay with you, and then they get shared, and so you can see why generations go by. Yeah. Where those stories, for good and bad, right? We tell our stories. Yeah. And the next generation, and it builds and it builds yeah. to where. We're at now where there's an intensity and there's a hinge point yeah. where we're having a different conversation now. Yeah. Now you are married, fast forward, to mm -hmm. a beautiful, amazing white woman. Yeah. yeah. And you have children that would be identified as of color because mm -hmm. I know not kids decide at various ages yeah. how yeah. they identify yeah. as. There's just no mixed race kid that can identify themselves as white. Yes. Unfortunately, it's just, it's just you can't. Yeah. So you you and then you're automatically labeled black. So and <laughs> and so now where you're at now, mm -hmm. we're in the middle of you've had these experiences. Now you're seeing them as a father. Yeah. And you have children that are out there yeah. having their own socialization. Yeah. What have you found that has been the most intense part of being in the middle of this racial hinge point right now where people are coming to the table of all colors to say Oh, okay. I can't ignore the door. Mm -hmm. We've all walked through the prejudice door yeah, yeah. and we're having a conversation. Yeah. What do you say about what we're in the middle of right now? I think the toughest thing is, um, for me, is seeing people that look like me um, triggered. Yeah. And I am on the phone. All the time. All the time. And there are people who are just breaking down and they don't know why. Mm -hmm. And if you go and look at it from a mental mental Help. health point of view, when you look at triggers and things that trigger you, what people don't realize is that when you see someone that looks like you who is on the ground and someone has their knee for nine minutes and with no, no, no hesitation of just letting this man die, what you see is that they're doing it to you because you're a man and you're black. And then the women see that the black women see that and, you know, they're nurturers, they're mothers. And so they're also triggered. And so when we're crying out like that and people are saying to us, you know, get over, get it. over it. You know what I mean? It's like it's like me telling you to get over 9-11. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you're going to you're telling us to forget. But then you put up the biggest flag on the planet. You know what I mean? Over a plane that went into the Twin Towers, which was absolutely horrific. Right. You know what I mean? It's like we've got to be allowed to be seen as going through something horrific and being able to pay tribute to what we remember and to what our forefathers remembered. It's just like me saying to you, well, you weren't in the Twin Towers. What's your problem? Why, why is it such a big deal to you? And the greatest you know? gift we can give each other is that we sit yeah. and we hold space yeah. for someone to say, yeah. right now, mm -hmm. I'm in a lot of grief yeah. about what I'm seeing on the news and what is one of millions of incidences. Yeah. Jesus left the 90 and 9, right? To go for the one. Go for the one. It, the 90 and 9 weren't, weren't any least, you know, he still loved them. Yeah. He's like the same as the one. But right now it's their fire that's burning. And then the Lord, then maybe, it's it's so funny because it's like, I felt like that one, you know, three years ago, that one was maybe like the LGBT movement. And then two years ago, that one was probably maybe the Me Too movement, Right. right? 
and we let them have their moment. You have to. And no we, one's going to be able, no one's going to say, you know what I mean? Oh, LGBT. Yeah, but we're struggling as well. Now, I, I, I don't remember any black man that went online and talked about, and, and, and a person from the LGBTQ community who was screaming and said, well, look what, look what they've done to us for the last 400 years. I don't hear that. That would be the most in, in, in just like insincere thing that you could say right then. But because this is such a powerful, see, here's the thing. There is, there has to be this separation of this repentance. It's like mm-hmm. you, 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 you've got to say you cannot, you cannot respond with a but. Right. You cannot, because once you say that, no matter what you say before that, in the gate. You're just saying that you don't really care and give a flying rip. Yep. So I saw something beautiful that explained it for, for words that trigger communities. For, for example, white privilege mm-hmm. that triggers people, right? Yeah. Well, wait, I'm not, I've had hard things, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I saw this great meme, <laughs> right? <laughs> that said, if your wife came to you and said, I you know, you. I love you. Mm-hmm. And you said, yeah, but I love everyone. Yeah. Oh, it's she's true. Slap you right. across it's four true. sides of your face. <laughs> right. First off, right. it's true. are you sleeping on the couch? <laughs> right. It's true, but it's hurtful. Yeah. Or yeah. your coworker loses a, a parent yeah. and, and you say, well, everyone's parent dies. Yeah, yeah. It's true, but it's hurtful. Yeah. And so what you, what I hear you saying is that we've come to a moment where it's turned into a fever pitch of pain Yeah. and it's time for all of us to allow the space yeah. for this story to be told. You have to understand how you will treat your young kid that comes with you with an issue. Yes. You you have to you have to do that. And even if the issue is you. Sitting in that pain is hard. When mom and dad is sitting there and the issue with the kid is saying it's your fault, but the only way you're gonna get the healing is when you sit there and you allow them to talk about you. Right. And the pain that you have shown them Are any other way you've lost them yes forever and it allows right? people to move forward through that pain yeah to find healing yeah to come to solution yeah what have you done because you're honest about this struggle and your personal experiences and then what you see in a community yeah but i see you as like the children of israel walking through the wilderness <laughs> they were given a little manna every day to do their wilderness experience, what has been your manna every day to get through this? You know, when you're on a plane and it says that, you know, before you get the mask on your kid, put the mask on yourself first. That's what I have to do every day. How do you do that? Scripture reading. Scripture reading. I'm not talking about just scripture nibbling. I get up 4.30 every morning. It was uh, from January the 1st. I had a very strong impression where the Lord was telling me, I've got seven kids, right? It's, it's crazy in my house all the time, you know? And it was driving me crazy yes. because I felt like I I, I had to no find, peace. yeah, and I didn't know how to do that. And one night the Lord was like, I want you to get up 4.30 every morning. And I'm like, I can't even get up at 8.30 in the morning. You know what I mean? I was so like, you know what I mean? But then I started doing it. I fought the first day, second day, it was hard, third day. And then eventually... I started having time at the table of the Lord at his seat and asking him what he wants me to do, what he wants me to say, what he wants me to read, what he wants me to think about today. And that reservoir that has has come, it was a preparation because the Lord was was telling me something was coming and I didn't want to be, I wanted to be the ally. The Lord's always known that I want to be the ally, but you can't be an ally if you are screaming yourself. If you are in hurting and pain, not saying that I'm not mad, not saying I'm not angry, not saying I'm in those feelings. But right now, nobody needs my anger. There are many people that they anger me because what the other people, what you have to realize is that every black man doesn't have the same story. (laughs) We always get tainted with the same thing. Like there'll be different stories. If you ask like 50 black men to stand right here and testify to you about what they're going through race, every single one will be different, even if you live in the same area. And so right now, for me, I realized that that's what the Lord wanted me to be. That's why he prepared me. To be a teacher. And, and it makes me, even it's just a comforter. Yes. You know what I mean? And it was just, it's So just that been, you can lead your family and help. Yeah. I have, I, I have no time for anger in my home because I'm the one, 
myself and my wife to strive to bring the spirit in that home. Yes. And I've got my kids that need it. And they're watching Especially you. now more than ever. Because they see that what's playing out. Ain't nobody got time to be sitting around mad and angry about everything because one, it messes you up. We know. You're a therapist. You know. You know how, the, how the, you know, right? So it's like I have that, but I have to try and squash it as soon as I can. There's been times I've let it linger and then I've not been in the best place for anybody, yes. including myself. You're trapped in it. So there was, I think it was James Baldwin that says, you have to love these people. He's talking to the black people, by the way, about white. He says, no matter what, you have to accept them and you have to love them because what they're going through, okay, right now, is that it won't be fixed if they don't do something about it up here. It's a cycle. It won't be fixed. It's the Lord, our Savior says to us, if ye are not one, you are not mine. Ye are not mine. And so this is what the fix is all about. Isn't it interesting how this happened, right? You got the COVID? Yes, where everyone then, was fatigued. Yeah. And then, you know, remember what it said, like, I, I saw some post that said, this is Heavenly Father telling us all to sit in the corner and shut up for a little while, <laughs> right? And so imagine if that's what it is. So we're yes. sitting, now we're more open. No more distractions. We don't have any distractions. We don't have any deadlines. And then the second pandemic Breaks kicked open. in. Yeah. Come on. Yes. Come on. It's a moment. That is definitely not an accident. I feel the Lord was like, okay, this time... Are they going to listen? You have to listen. Oh, they, they have to. You have no choice. Because every single company that's posted something, that their mission statement has already changed. Already. You go on, on you, the first thing you see on Netflix, Black Lives Matter, what? Yes. You cannot ignore it. And here's the test. It's how you're reacting to it. How you're reacting to it. So if you're white and you're acting in defensiveness, then you get to pause and say, why? Yes. And, and I've said to my white friends, go down below that feeling. What yeah. is the fear? The fear is, yeah. well... I don't want to be part of the problem and yeah. I'm sad too. Great. And so, there are some people thinking that the fear is that they were going to take over. It, really? Yeah. And what you got to realize is that God is a God of abundance. He has enough for, for everyone. everyone. There's so many times, you know, like when that guy is got, he goes in to, for that job and he sees his best friend and he knows how dope his best friend is. And there's like, oh crap. <laughs> it's me and you. It's like, now you are a threat. I want this job. You being here is going to mess up my chances. No, it's right. not. So it's God's children saying, well, there's not enough love Subconsciously, for all of us. There, yes. are men, there, are, there are people that are thinking that. Yes. And that won't ever be the case. But that's the devil's side of things. Because I am so much better with you than without you. Listen, the piano, right? I always talk about this all the time. The black? When you play the piano, the black keys, it plays Negro spirituals. Yeah. And when you play just the white keys alone, you get a whole bunch of Frank Sinatra songs. <laughs> but when you play both keys together, oh, what do you get? You have a variety. You have more songs than you can ever imagine. You see, God loves variety. God loves diversity. It is not until you play the black and white keys together that you get the most beautiful, beautiful music. I love that. that and that's what this is all about. The Lord is telling us it's time. We got to get that Stevie Wonder and Paul McCartney song "Ebony Ivory" back out here again. Go watch, the, go read the lyrics. Everything good happened in the. Go 80s. check out the lyrics on that <laughs> right? song. Oh, I. I'm gonna have it. to do a remake. You can sing. I'll just do a remake with you. You can okay. be Paul McCartney. But anyway, wait a minute. My mom, <laughs> my mom is watching this, and she is gonna, she's gonna stalk you if you don't play good on that. Let's do it. You heard it. Yeah. You heard it on the middle. Um, Alex, I could talk to you for five hours straight <laughs> because this is a complicated issue mm -hmm. and we are not trying to oversimplify it in a 10 minute yeah. segment because there are no answers but there are yes. definitely places to start but i love the idea of seeing the piano keys as the direction we're heading towards yeah. yeah um what would be one invitation that your black friends and white friends watching this mm -hmm. and brown and yellow and whatever part of the rainbow that they can do today to move us to those piano keys. I would say that if you can, if you treat everyone like your struggling son or your struggling daughter, it'll be a lot different. Your son is struggling and going through a hard time and they need mom. They need dad. They need them to be home. One of the reasons why these, these are, sorry, that's my sorry. One of the reasons why these, these prisons are filled with men <clears throat> of color men of color and even men in general is because they lost connection with their mothers 
So you've got to treat them like your family, literally. Like, how would it be different now? If your kid came up and said the stuff that you see, that you read, how would you treat them? Would you say, but? Would you say, you know what I mean? And knowing that you're going to lose them. Yes. Knowing that you're about to lose them. If you say, but, you are going to lose. Yeah. So you're saying, <clears throat> as we sit and do what you and I just did, mm -hmm. and have one conversation, yeah. and we don't say the but, we yeah. just hold space for each other's pain, Yeah. we move towards the black and white piece. Just listen. It's yeah. time to listen. It's just time to listen. That's it. There's, that's, that's the only answer right now. It might be different another time. But right now, the well, fire is, the, 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 the house is burning. And we've just got to listen. And you just got to listen. And how you listen will help me understand what side of the fence you're on. I love that. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sis. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Thank you for joining us <clears throat> for this important conversation. As we are all living the middle of this moment where we have an opportunity to head towards, as Alex said, towards a better piano keyboard, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the best gift we can give while we're in the middle of this is to listen. Thank you for joining us here on The Middle, and thank you, Alex, for, thank you. Thanks your, for your willingness. Me.